Hello and welcome to Healthmark's seven days of CEUs, where we're celebrating you, the sterile processing technician, and your contributions to patient safety. For each day of CS Week, one of Healthmark's educators will be presenting an educational video worth one CEU that you can use towards your recertification. It's just Healthmark's small way of saying thank you for everything that you do to save patients' lives and for being the heartbeat of the hospital. So with that, happy CS Week, and let's get to today's video. Hello, my name's Steve Kovac. And this program is called Ensuring Your Medical Automated Washer is Working Properly. This program is an introduction to help you, the user, to better understand how the medical automated washer works and for you to use your critical thinking skills to dig deeper into this topic once this program is done. This is my disclosure. This presentation reflects the techniques, approaches, and opinions of me, the individual. I'm going to use snippets from IFUs, from standards and guidelines, peer-reviewed literature. It is up to you to read that and get the full content of what those articles and standards are about. Our policy is to educate our customer because we believe an educated customer is our best customer in that it's more than just buying a product or running a, a test about quality improvement. Every program has objectives, and I believe what's important is that you understand about the medical washer as the attendee. There are certain factors that come to play on making sure you have a clean device when it comes out. We're gonna talk about those factors. And then I'm also going to give you an example of a quality improvement process that can help ensure that your medical washer is performing the way it should be. And I believe pictures help tell us stories and I will have pictures and videos to share with you as we go along. So there are many factors. I'm not gonna hit them all in this 35 minutes or so we're together, but these are some of them equipment, guidelines, how the device is made, the soil, water, temperature, cleaning solutions, the human factor, and of course, introduce you to a quality process or verifying that your washer is working. So the first one is let's talk about the equipment and what you need to do to understand and use the equipment. Of course, the IFU, but you would need to know that there's different types of washers. I broke them down this way. There's what I call the North American model, relies on high impingement, real quick spinner arms, softer chemistry. I consider enzymes a softer chemistry. And the orifices or the openings in these spray arms are very small. So there's a lot of pressure coming through. That's why I call it high impingement. I have the European model, which relies on low impingement, the orifices are bigger, the spin arms don't spin as quickly, and they use a higher chemi a stronger chemistry, more alkaline chemistry. So again, that's some differences. The other thing, there's a batch, everything is a single chamber. So you put it in, it does everything, all the steps, or you can get a rack or conveyor with something called tonner washer. It'll have two, three, four different chambers doing different things like pre-wash, uh, sonic some have, and so on. But again, all these units are sold all over the world and you can get the same model in one place and meets a company, might just tweak it a little so they can sell it somewhere else. But here within the USA, the majority of medical automated washers found here are exempt from the 510K process because they only claim low to intermediate disinfection. And that's why they can be exempt. Now that same model somewhere else in the world can claim high level disinfection and even use something called A sub zero. But here in the US, that item or the washer will be claiming low to intermediate, so it's exempt. If they want to claim high level, 
then they must go through the 510K process. You need to understand your washer here is doing low to intermediate disinfection. Nothing wrong with that, but you need to understand it. The next thing you need to know is observation is important. You can see the person there is watching what goes on. Don't just push that rack in there. Watch it for a few seconds so you see what's going on. You can see down here in the bottom, I've taken an IFU and what it what people have to do daily and why. You want to make sure that your pumps are working, the spray arms are all there, they're not clogged. You could have broken pumps for the water, broken pumps for the detergent. You can have air or blocked uh, arms again, air in the tubing, missing arms. People can overload. All these things have an impact on whether those instruments are clean. And one failure can result in a complete process failure, or they can compound and cause some major issues. That's why it's important to understand the type of washer and some of the parts of it. So we're gonna quickly talk about spray arms and couplers. Why? Because the spray arm is what's gonna deliver what you need for the cleaning. It delivers the water, a cleaning solution, and if they're blocked or not there, they won't work as efficiently. The coupler is where the rack actually is pushed into the washer, it locks in, and then that water comes through and goes through different routes to spin those spinner arms. So that's what's very important about these two. So they deliver the cleaning solution. We're going to talk more in depth on the cleaning solution, but if you can look up here, look at that's too much solution. Foam is no good for many reasons. How are you going to rinse all that off? unless you change your rinse cycle and foam will ruin your pump because it's pumping air and bubbles in that solution. Look here, in this pump, in the tubing, there's air, so you're not gonna get the right amount of cleaning solution. Here you have a leak. It was so bad it created an icicle. Here, this is from hard water and probably too much detergent. Look at the gunk there. And this is what should be done on a regular basis. Um, your technician who's ever doing it, they need to titrate or meter and make sure you're getting the right amount of cleaning solution because if they don't, you will have problems. And in today's world, it used to be one to two ounces. Now it's like a sixteenth to a half or a quarter ounce. You want to make sure that is working properly. So friction in a washer is called impingement. Think of a spray nozzle on your hose. You get it nice and tight. It's a jet. Open it up. It's a fan. So cleaning needs friction and fluid, and it comes through the nozzle. Failure in any one spray arm will affect the washer's overall ability to clean the instruments. The nozzle is a device designed to control the direction or characteristics of the fluid flow. That's important. Now, the next few slides I'm going to show I want to thank Tim Brooks gave this presentation many, many years ago. And I want to thank Tim for letting me use just some of his slides. He's got a really good program if you ever see it, but I'm using a couple. So when it comes to your automated washer, you look at it 100% of cleaning. Where is it coming from? 60% is coming from your spray arms. So think of a spray arm that has 10 holes. And if two of them are blocked, you're only getting 80%. So you're getting only 80% of that 60. 40% is from the chemical and thermal the temperature, the water, the cleaning solution. So let's say you got air bubbles in the line or it's kinked and you're not getting all of it. Now you're compounding the problem and those items are not going to be as clean as they're supposed to. Here's an example of the low impingement, notice it's bigger orifices. Here's smaller, the high impingement. Look at the, the holes, they're smaller. And look, they're even got something coming out of it. And this screen is very important. I want you to think of this screen as a cheese grater. And look, there's stuff here. As that impingement and that water hits, it fine finally cuts up that plastic or the paper and gets through the screen and then goes and gets clogged in both the pump and the impeller. 
but also in the orifices of those spray arms. That's why it's important to do your daily, even shift, cleaning of those screens. So the spray arm impingement, you have a rack, you put two instruments. So I want you to think about this. You see areas where the spray action might not reach? What if some of the spray arms are clogged? How efficient is your washer going to perform? And if it happens on one level, you don't get all the water to cascade down. So look at the spray pattern there. You see the ends, even though some spray arms have openings on the end, what if they get clogged? How you load that washer, what you do is very important. The next part I wanna talk about is standards and guidelines. You need to review them and see how they can work in your practice. You have Amy, AORN, CDC, OSHA, here in the United States, CMS, Joint Commission, but there's something they all have in common. There's certain words that, whether it's an ISO standard or an AMI or an ASTM standard, those words pretty much read and mean the same. They're shall, should, may, can, and must. You need to know what those words mean when you read those standards. Shall, and this is you'll find a lot, indicates requirements strictly to be filed to conform to the standard. You shall do it. May or can, must is, you must do. So when it comes to standards and guidelines, read them, see how they work and how they apply in where you are. Because you could be working in an old facility, a new facility, but you need to read those and adapt them. Next is we know that those the device, the design, how it's to be clean has a huge impact. Um, I divide it up into two areas, simple and complex. I know other people divide them up more, but simple without a lot of challenges, bone spikes, osteotone probes, standard pickups, complex devices with challenge designs, the box lock. I'll show you some pictures later. It's that's nook and crannies, Lumens are a challenge, multiple parts, various metals. Sometimes the IFUs are incomplete, and that makes it a challenge. What do you do? So again, I got a picture here of a box lot that's bloody and the challenge. And then here's some picture of orthopedics. Most of us think of orthopedic items as challenging, and they are. So that affects how you load it how they'll be exposed to the cleaning process. The next thing we need to talk about is the type of soil you're trying to clean. And again, all of these points, we could spend almost a whole hour presentation on. I'm just trying to barely give you a minute or two on each point. So the type of soil, that soil, we have blood, fecal matter, protein. Uh, if you have a endoscope, it could be different, but I believe we all can say the majority of the substance we're trying to clean off is blood. So we should understand blood best of all. So if it's the number one challenge, the red part of the hemoglobin, we know is highly insolvent when it dries out, but it's water soluble when it's wet or moist. So that red should be taken off in the pre-rinse cycle. If it gets too hardened or gets too hot or exposed to hot, hot or high temperatures, it begins to denature. Now, depending on where you read, some say 110, some say 95, I put down in general 100 degrees is hot and blood will begin to denature. And so it denatures, again, it becomes more insolvent. So when you know what major soil you're trying to clean, it would help in selecting the proper cleaning solution and cycle parameters for your washer. It makes sense. So the next thing you need to know about is water quality, pH, hardness, what do those terms mean? Some even say alkalinity. You should know the source of the water coming into your department. You should have the purest water for rinsing. Uh, with poor water, you're gonna get staining, pitting, biofilm, just overall dirty instruments. So if you don't realize the type of water you have in, 
that's a failure of you and your department of not knowing how to treat it and make it better so you have an outcome of clean instruments. So Amy has a lot of good documents and they're water documents. And if you notice over the last couple of years, your IFUs have been changing. They're becoming more specific with the type of water you need. You need basically two types. They've divided it. Utility water is coming from the tap and usually needs no further treatment if you're using it for basic flushing, washing, the initial rinse, mixing with your cleaning chemistries, unless the IFU says you need specific, specifically some type of water, but they'll usually say utility or tap. Then there's critical water, and that's water that is treated. And it's important for steam sterilization, and it's important for cleaning to have the purest rinse possible so it can clean, rinse away all that residual that's left on those medical devices. And usually you're looking at deionized water, DI, or RO, reversed osmosis water. That's usually what your final rinse should be. And that's very important and you need that. I believe you should do regular testing of the key parameters of water. It's a good idea. I personally believe you should do it every week. Data and trending, data is king. So sometimes the water could be changed coming into your department and you don't know it. And it's good to know if there's a change and you can adjust accordingly. So quickly, let's discuss what is uh, pH and what is water hardness. pH is on a scale from zero to 14 and seven and a little on both sides is considered neutral. And you can look at that if you look at lemon juice is a, a, a two and the soap you use every day is a nine at home. And I have the word acid and bases. I grew up with that. Bases are also alkaline. And some of your detergents are more alkaline. They're nine or 10. And sometimes when it gets too high, you have to use a neutralizer to neutralize it. So knowing where everything is at, you want to try to be as close to seven as possible. When it comes to water hardness, we're talking in parts per million. Some people talk in grains per gallon. And what you really want to do is keep it under 100. And the closer you are around 50 or that is, is good. That's a good quality of water when it comes to um, the hardness. That's just a couple of the things you need to remember. But that's good to know because if that starts changing, you can have problems with dirty instruments and using too much or too little detergent. The next thing you have to do is understand temperature. Some people say hotter is better, except I believe it's wrong. You wanna get the right temperature. You need the right temperature at different stages of the cleaning process. Cold pre-rinse, probably between 70, 80, under a 90, so you can wash that hemoglobin away. 90 is even a little too high. Um, as you use different cleaning solutions, they will have optimum temperature. Maybe your enzymes work around 120, your detergents 140, 150. If it gets too high for the enzymes, they might not work at all. And if it gets too cold, they might not work. So you should know the temperature. And remember, if that surgical instrument or medical device is exposed to too hot of a temperature in the pre-wash, that blood might stay on there and get denatured and become hard. So that's why you should know the various temperatures at each stages. And if you know that, that helps you get to the best practice. We suggest using a data logger that goes into your tray when you do testing, that's stainless steel, and it represents the temperature the instruments are doing. Because some of the automated washers, the probe is located where the water comes out, and there is a temperature difference. So the standards and medical device companies do say you should know your temperature and you should monitor it. And it gives you good feedback for troubleshooting. Next is cleaning solution, chemistry, dilution, the time it's exposed to. So you need good water. So you better make sure when you read the label, it'll say dilution is dependent upon temperature and the type of water. So you need to know hardness and pH. 
We're not here to discuss the pluses and minuses. The marketing of those detergent companies will do that. It's important to know that they're all not created equal and you need to do your due diligence and read up on picking the right type of cleaning solution for your task. It should be low foaming, and we talked a little bit about foam, and I'll have a video on it. If you have the correct dilution, and you can use enzymes or neutral pH or acid or alkaline cleaners, the combination, but get the right one for the job. But this is what's important. You need energy to clean. Remember, you need friction and fluid. The chemical energy is provided by the cleaning agent mixing with the water. So if you have poor water quality, you'll get a poor outcome. Thermal energy to get that low to intermediate disinfection is provided by the warm or hot water at a certain temperature for a certain length of time or dwell time. It does not come from the blower. It comes from the temperature of the water, whether it's 180 for one minute or 192 for one minute or whatever it is to get that low to intermediate disinfection in washers here in the United States. And the mechanical energy is provided by the machine the impingement, the force of that water coming out of that spray arm, that's taking over for the manual rubbing and brushing. So water quality and the temperature of it is so important. So knowing the temperature is important because it has to be different at different stages. That's why you need to monitor it and know it. Cleaning solutions. Again, we could spend hours on this. We're gonna briefly talk about enzymes and detergents in general. Enzymes break down the fibrin in the blood and the protein, albumin, and that's there. And many people look at it as a lock and key. Certain enzymes work on certain substances. And the enzymes we basically use in a medical device reprocessing department is lipase breaks down fats and greases. Hmm, remember soils? What if you're doing a knee? That's synovial fluid. You might need a lipase or an alkaline detergent to break that down because protease only works on proteins. Or maybe you'll need a multi-enzyme for orthopedic items that has protease and lipase in it. There's cellulase and there's amylase. You might need amylase if you're a department that cleans K-pumps and that, and you have some of the starch and carbohydrates to clean off that K-pump. Pick the right detergent right cleaning solution for the job. So detergents are effective. And again, not here to discuss which one's better, but they have something. Detergents contain one or more types of surfactants. And in the cleaning process, surface tension must be reduced so water can spread out and it's called wetting. Surfactants or the wetting agents also perform other functions such as emulsifying, uh, loosening the debris and keeping it dispersed in the water so it's held in suspension so it can be rinsed away. So each company puts their own little twist on their cleaning chemistries. So next is the human factor. I mean, we can have the right cleaning solution. Our washer could be working right, have the right PMA done and the instruments still come out clean. Why? Just some of the reasons. Has your staff been trained on it, both new and those who've been there? Do they know what the impact of overloading is, disassembling instruments, how to operate it, how to stop it, the safety, the daily maintenance they must do? Are they using it properly? I believe you can never overtrain staff. I also believe all staff, no matter where you are, you have some type of certification to work and a medical device reprocessing department because you know then the, the technician or the manager has a basic understanding of what's going on because we all know everybody wants to automate things. We need to know how these washers work. And I believe it should be one of your yearly competencies where they know how to stop the washer, open it up, but also how to load it properly, give them a task of, some orthopedic trays, some other trays. Are they putting them on a stringer and opening up those box locks as wide as it can for the, the device IFUs? Um, you also got to make sure the PMA is done. I hear this so much. Oh, 
Our watcher is now on as need only when something breaks down. People try to cut corners. That is bad management. Management needs to understand the consequences of their choices. There's a PMA for a reason, whether it's five years, 10 years, every six months, every year, things wear out. The bearings or pumps wear out. It shouldn't be on an as need basis. That's cutting quarters. Remember, quality doesn't cost, it pays. Put the quality in. I've been in some departments that their washers are eight to nine years old. They look brand new and others that are two or three years old and look like they've gone through the ringer. And yes, you've got to work with your customer, the OR. They have to understand their impact. If you're getting those bloody instruments back and there's no point of use cleaning, no wetting, I call this called the decontam hold time. From the time the surgery ends to the time it goes into the washer, you start your cleaning process or your manual cleaning. What is that time? It's got to be a small length of time. Some say 10, 15 minutes. And if you don't have a wetting solution on it or put in a humi pad or a wet towel over it, you've got issues because we know that blood, if it gets dry, is harder to clean. So again, they're not doing point of use cleaning. Something's wrong. So now let's put all those things together. We're going to talk about having a quality process or verifying it. Equipment verification. Making sure the washer works the way it is. You bought it to clean medical devices, to clean lumens and complex devices. So you're going to review the IFU and see what they have to say. You're going to follow the PMA and get qualified people. You're going to pick cleaning verification tests, read the standards and guidelines, and you do that to help ensure the equipment are performing. There's a whole slew of them to pick from. Some tests are designed to challenge the operational levels of the cleaning equipment. Some tests either measure a specific parameter or challenge the cleaning efficacy of the entire system. But not all cleaning verification tests are created the same. And that's, we know, and I'm going to point out some things in this next few slides. You must understand what a test tells you both when it passes and when it fails. I go in many departments and they say, my pass always passes, always passes. I don't need to do it. The company said I can only use their test. That's not true. That is not true. You can use the test that you believe needs to challenge your device your medical washer the way it should. Um, you should do daily inspection. I want you to think of your sterilizer. And we're going to talk about this briefly in a minute. Document your results. Put in a quality management process. Clinically relevant evidence-based products. Let's explore it. It starts when you buy and install your equipment. In your request for your proposal, RFP, you can request that washers pass certain tests. You can tell them this washer needs to pass this. So just as your sterilizer, when you don't use it until it's commissioned, it goes through the IQ, OQ, PQ. The same thing should happen with your washer. When you get it new, go through these steps. And if you use a test that's clinically relevant and evidence-based, you know the day you bought it before it went in service, it passed this test. And then if it fails, you know you can go back and figure out what happened. Is it human error or something else? So that's, that part deals with the PQ or performance qualification. Is the washer doing what it states it can do? Test the various cycle or test your regular instrument cycle. What type of test do I perform and use? Clinically relevant, evidence-based. What are my key performance indicators that I should be tracking daily, weekly, monthly, or so on. So I call this the cleaning facts. And in Amy ST79, uh, Annex D, they talk about you should have a visual test and a cleaning efficacy of equipment and monitoring the cleaning parameters. And you should monitor both internal and external parts of the medical device. And they says you should put this in to make sure it's working properly. And you should have two basic components. The first one is established benchmark using specific soil markers 
relevant to devices used on patients and use rapid, easy to perform tests that are reliable. Makes sense. So now we have the criteria. So what's some of the peer reviewed literature out there? These, this one says, I'm only quoting two out of many because we don't have all day. I want to do this in about 35, 40 minutes. We got about seven or eight minutes left. This says we use Halstead mosquito forceps as a model instrument because they are widely used in surgical procedures and they're difficult to clean due to hinge and serrated jaws. Investigation into re reproducible cleaning of instruments based on worst case scenario, there should be these narrow to a little wider gap. Look at the instrument here. Look at the gap here and look at this product that's been out for well over 22 years. It is a toast, yeah, I can see it. Look at the challenge gap it is. We're gonna talk more about it. Peer reviewed literature, design a test that is soil you're trying to clean. Remember when I said guidelines? There's an ASTM guideline. It's me say, what's ASTM? Many of you pick your gowns and decontam or in surgery based upon classifications, one, two, three, or four. That's based on ASTM test, testing. Well, there's an ASTM test, it's called D7225.06. It's a guide based on standard test soil correlating the blood suitable for screening tests and evaluating the cleaning efficacy of washer disinfectors. So remember that request for a proposal, you can request that it pass ASTM D7725.06 and pick a test that meets that qualifications. There's other literature that supports using organic contaminants that are representative of the soils to be found on the device, like hemoglobin protein or carbohydrates or other soils. Dr. Alpha wrote a great article, which I'm gonna go into detail on the next slide. There's been many articles on blood as a soil on surgical instruments, and I'm gonna take a graph in a second and show you that. So when you're talking soil, there's a lot of different peer reviewed literature. And this one compared two different tests that were out there. And one was, I've X'd out the name. Uh, it's the washer monitor uses a color dye and print on a plastic sheet and positioned within a grid like holder. Whereas the TOSI device uses organic material reflected of blood components that are dried on the surface of a metal coupon. And this is important. The other indicator was not included in the evaluation as it does not contain an organic soil, so it is not relevant to compare the diet uses as a visual indicator to the levels of organic material on patient used items. Another article, and the, the footnotes are there. The FDA recommends that any simulated use testing be done with a device that closely approximates the actual type of soil the the devices is to be exposed to in clinical uses. The Peric soil test, which is a test soil on the TOSI, has been used by the FDA for studies such as clinically defined, clinically relevant test soils for cleaning validation of reusable medical devices. Those footnotes are there. So it meets the criteria. And this is from another peer reviewed literature where the TOSI soil the cleaning kinetics is so close to human blood. That's why it's such a great soil. And it's been the gold standard for well over 22 years. So after reviewing the literature, I believe medical device reprocessing professionals would want a verification test that is a challenge to their washer. One with nooks and crannies, serrations, soil that is representing a true challenge. This verification test would be part of a process to ensure their washer was performing as intended. Remember, part of a process. So, when you put man and machine, there's going to be problems. We don't do it right, machines break down. You want to clean blood and other body fluids off of medical devices, mostly stainless steel. Thus, regular inspection and testing at the critical points is very important. Before 1998, Cleaning equipment wasn't challenged as it's challenged today in the department. 
maybe in labs and test labs, but not everyday use. And I can tell you that. I bought the first TOSI and started using it in 1999 in the US and have been using it ever since. And it works. It is a device that is a true surrogate device. Now we're challenging our washers because the standards are saying we should, but even before that, we should have. We should be following IQ, OQ, PQ when we get new equipment. Think of it as your sterilizer. You wouldn't just put that sterilizer in. You want to make sure that washer works and it can do what it's supposed to do. Um, you want to establish your KPIs. You want to clean blood off stainless steel. You want to know good water quality and good temperature and so on. You should use clinically relevant evidence-based products. So what does that mean? Let's explore a quality improvement program you can use every day now if you're not using it. It is the TOSI. The TOSI has the gaps, even before many of the studies. It has a holder that you can see through to read the results. It's stained, stainless, same stainless steel. It has scratches that the material you're trying to use. The test soil is proven time after time again. It mimics dry blood 24 hours, worst case scenario has the components you need. It's a test object surgical instrument. It's safe to handle. And it works in any maker model of washer with any detergent. It is not made for one specific model or one specific detergent. That's why it's a true surrogate device. If it doesn't come clean, if you can't get blood off a of stainless steel with this challenge, you need to figure it out. That's why in your request for proposal, you should be asking for that to be there so you know it gets it done and you get your washer done correctly. We have always believed at Healthmark that it's a quality process. We've been telling people for over 20 years, monitor your water, document it, know your temperatures, your rinse temperature, disinfection temperature, your temperature at your different stages. Monitor each level of those racks. Those racks are different over time. Their heat, they bend. They don't keep the same shape. We tell you to put the rack number. They all should be racked. We have questions that are based upon the IFU when you read, read it. Are they blocked spray arms? Are they spinning properly? Are the washers correct? Are the couplers correct? Is there staining along the inside of the chamber wall your detergent? This is a quality process that you should be doing. Remember that picture of the gentleman looking at the washer as his instruments went in there? That's what you need to do. We have the aqua test that does three of simple parameters. You should do it at least weekly. That's for pH, alkalinity, and hardness. We have a whole program on water hardness and water quality. And we believe you should monitor your temperature independently. And this is a data logger that you can actually know the exact temperature of what your instruments are getting from the water. And so you can adjust your stages so you're getting optimal cleaning. This is all part of a quality process, understanding those key indicators. And then we're the only company. Remember in uh, Amy standard, it says also hollow lumen devices. We have a true surrogate device and the loom check. It's got everything you need to hook it up to test these types of washers. These can get plugged and you don't know if they're wor working. It, look, at, it looks just like a suction you have there. And there's a narrow opening there for that test coupon to test the flow and also the cleaning ability of the chemistry. So you're able to test your washer and all your racks. We've put together a nice simple chart of what you should do every load, every rack, beginning of the shift, during the shift, weekly, monthly, all based upon the standards and looking at as many of the different IFUs, reviewing those washer IFUs and putting something together that you can use no matter whose washer it is. And you adjust for the little nuances for that washer. Closing thoughts, put in place a program that helps you in advance find issues before they happen. Daily inspection sheets, water quality testing, 
temperature monitoring, test overall function with a test that represents what you are trying to clean every day, blood off stainless steel, a surrogate device with a challenge. And remember, if you didn't do the IQ OQ when you bought it, it's there in your department, start now, get that washer to get the test, understand the water quality and the temperature, get it to pass so you can have that washer working better than what it is now. So now we're gonna watch a few videos. This video here is showing where somebody just loaded the washer, walked away, and the ring handle is blocking the spray arm from moving. And you can see on the top, it's a low impingement and it's going slowly, but it wasn't even working the way it should. Again, human factor, another human factor. This is where the coupler's bad and the water is coming this way. But if you notice, the spray arms are very moving very slowly because there's all this foam and that foam doesn't give the impingement and the speed it needs to move around. Again, if you see that, that washer should be stopped and get fixed and figure out what's going on. Human error with mechanical error of the dosing pump not working correctly. This one, look at that. All that stuff's gonna block those spray arms. Look at their block, there's calcium deposits. This is disgusting. This is what people were doing and putting their instruments in every day. I have hundreds, thousands of pictures of, this is unbelievable. Look at the calcium on the side. This is why you put a quality process in that you ask what's going on and you review this. But look at that, this is, and you're putting instruments in there. That's gonna be on your instruments. You got one more video here. Now watch this. The one on the left is working great. The one on the right is not. This one on the right should have been stopped and never used. And I hate to say it passed both of the tests of that one they were using when we came in to help them solve a problem. Ours passed on the left, but the one on the right did not pass. So again, challenge your washers correctly. Human error. You got to stop this. You might have everything working and it passes the test, but if you don't load it right, you've got problems. See how it all gets together, training and everything? So again, verification should not be an option. There's 42 CFR code that states facilities should put in processes that work to make sure equipment functions properly. You need to work with different manufacturers and Healthmark, we believe, is one of them. It, our cleaning verification products can help our customers achieve best practice and meet the CFR code. So there's questions you should ask yourself. I call it the cleaning verification test. What are you using now? What does your present test tell you if it passes and when it fails? What is the soil it's made out of? What is the challenge it's made out of? What are most of your devices? What are they made out of? What is the soil you're trying to clean? Does your test sound like what you're trying to clean? Uh, does it reflect what you're really doing? Think of your sterilizer. You test your sterilizer with the most challenging products to make sure it works. If you don't get something clean, it might not be sterilized. Don't you think you should be testing your washer with the best test? and make sure it's working, your washer is properly and checking other key parameters. It's not just one test, it's a combination of knowledge and putting in a quality process that makes sure your washer works. So I wanna thank you very, very much. Um, remember Healthmark has continuing education, podcast webinars, YouTube channel, CEU programs. We have sterile processing dollars, we have provide speakers at no charge to groups, associations, medical facilities. We do clinical practice reviews to help prepare you for audits. We give you technical supports. We wanna make sure you understand what a test tells you both when it passes, but when it fails, but to make sure your equipment is working the way it should. I wanna thank you very much and remind you that you are the heart of the hospital you do a great job every day. And thank you for the time you just spent with me. Take this knowledge and share it with everybody else. 
Bye now. Thank you for watching and for being a part of Healthmark's seven days of CEUs. If I could ask just one small favor in return, please like this video and subscribe to the Healthmark Education channel so we can continue to spread the word of education to as many CS technicians as we possibly can. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for everything you do for patients, and we hope you have a very happy CS week.